Hello, welcome to the channel. You've probably heard about how there are certain types of mushrooms that can really positively improve our physical and mental health. So I'm guessing that's why you're here. <laughs> yes, so there are certain mushrooms that have been used in traditional Chinese medicine for hundreds of years. And in more recent years, this has become a hot topic of conversation across the rest of the world. Um, and this has resulted in hundreds of companies launching loads of different types of medicinal mushroom products. Whilst there are a few really good and trustworthy companies in the UK that are producing some really high quality supplements and stuff that I could recommend, I'm also a very big advocate of doing things yourself and in the cheapest way possible. So that's what this video is about basically. So let's go and find some different types of mushrooms growing here in the UK and talk about how you can find them for yourself and then later on I'll touch a bit more on the medicinal functions and why you might want to use them and also the ways that you can prepare them in order to access the different types of compounds that there are. Yes, exciting, let's go. <laughs> so here's a great example of the birch polypore, Formitopsis betulina. That one at the top is one of last year's decaying fruit bodies and then this one in the middle here is a lot fresher so this is probably this year's fruit. I personally wouldn't pick this one because it's very brown underneath. It's not in very good condition. You could probably harvest some of it from around the outer edges but I'd prefer to just find a fresher example. So this is a younger and fresher one that I found earlier and it was growing underneath a silver birch log so it seemed that the younger ones were sprouting from underneath the log where it was more protected I think. So birch polypore don't have any lookalikes and definitely not any poisonous lookalikes. You really can't go wrong when collecting these because they only grow on silver birch like this. So whilst this isn't the most popular medicinal mushroom at the moment, it still has a long list of really good medicinal uses. It's an anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral and anti-tumor and this underside here, when it's quite fresh, you can peel it off and use it as a wound adhesive. And that's where those antibacterial uses would come in. And it's also a styptic too, so it can help to stop bleeding. Quick safety caution. So if you have any serious illnesses or you're taking regular medications, then it would definitely be wise to just check with a health professional before you start adding any mushrooms and herbal supplements into your diet. I mean, the general advice is for anyone to check with a health professional before they start adding natural stuff into their diet. I just thought I'd throw that out there just to make sure that people are going to try and stay safe. <laughs> so I've just found this lovely old fallen piece of birch and growing on it is a red belted polypore. So this is Formitopsis panicula, just down there. It looks very similar to the hoof fungus actually but obviously as you get closer, you can see that red belt that goes around the outer edge of the cap. Here's some younger examples just down here. And as you can see, they like to grow on silver birch, but also mainly on conifer trees. So this fungus is noted as having medicinal properties. There are a few studies out there, but it's not yet been as researched as turkey tails, for example. So you're not really gonna hear about this one being used in a supplement out on the market but by all means do your own research. I've just taken this little one here and I'm going to take it home and probably make a tincture with this because it does share the same sort of benefits as the birch polypore. So this is just a new one for me to experiment with. Okay this is a really exciting find that I was not expecting to make today. So this is the Scarlet Caterpillar Club Cordyceps Militaris and if you do spot one there will quite often be a few more growing nearby, but you'd really have to have a good look. This medicinal fungus is known for its energy boosting properties. And I do know that some people have had success in using this to fight fatigue and especially people that have experienced long COVID symptoms, this has helped them to get past that. So yeah, that's an interesting one to look into, but finding just one like this, you're not going to get very far with making a tincture or medicine from it because it's just not substantial enough. If you're going to make some sort of cordyceps extract, then you would want to do your own home grow and then you'd be able to harvest a substantial amount in order to make that. Okay, I'm going to have a go excavating it. 
it will probably be a massive fail because it's not the easiest thing to do. So I'm just ever so carefully digging a few inches down into the soil and around the mushroom. And then hopefully when I pull it out, we are going to be able to see the insect pupa that the fungus is growing out of. Oh my God, look, there it is. Wow, this is so cool. I didn't do this with the first cordyceps that I found. So this is the first time I've done this and it's actually quite fresh. Let's try and uncover it a bit more. To the wider public that don't know a lot about fungi, Cordyceps generally is known as the zombie fungus. However, there are hundreds of different species, most of them infecting insects and only some of them infecting other fungi. So for this cordyceps that I found, the fungus has spread its hyphae into the moth or butterfly larva here and has consumed it and then the orange mushroom has fruited out of the body. This particular species doesn't control its host. I believe it's some of the Ophiocordyceps species that are capable of hijacking the nervous system or muscles and making an insect move. This is very fiddly work. I'm trying my best not to wreck it. But there you have it. That's a wild cordyceps or zombie fungus. These are turkey tails, Trametes versicolor and it's probably one of the most talked about medicinal mushrooms. It's got a lot of research behind it and it's just one of the most popular mushroom supplements out there on the market at the moment. It's a very common mushroom that likes to grow on dead hardwood. So you'll commonly find it growing on fallen trees and stumps of beech, oak and birch, for example. So you might see these growing in a few different color variations containing colors such as gray, dark blue, lighter gray or some will be more brown with a reddy orange in them and sometimes you might see a bit of green but this is probably just some algae growing on the top. The upper surface is ever so slightly hairy and this gives it a very velvety feel and then they have concentric multicolored zones on the top in some of the colors that I mentioned and then on the underside they will have tiny white pores. They have a few lookalikes, one being the smoky bracket which only comes in a brown beige gray color scheme and it has no rings as such, it's more of a colour gradient. And then underneath it has grey pores, so younger ones will be a lighter grey and older ones it will be quite a dark grey. You've then got the Styrium group of species, a few of which grow in the UK. One is known as the hairy curtain crust and it's an orangey yellow on the top and the bottom with a hairy upper surface. There's also the yellow curtain crust, which is yellow, orange, red, and it does have some rings. So it does look quite a lot like the turkey tail, but it's just a different color scheme. And it's the same kind of colors underneath, but a bit paler and it does not have any pores. There is also a turkey tail relative, which is the ochre bracket, Trametes ochracia. And it's rather similar to the turkey tail, but with a brown, yellow ochre color scheme. There are some small studies on this species that indicates it also has some medicinal value, just like the turkey tail, but obviously it's not as researched. None of these lookalikes that I've mentioned are noted as being poisonous, but obviously it's still good to know what you're picking. So make sure you can identify any lookalikes before you collect any mushrooms. You've probably heard of the famous medicinal mushroom, the reishi, and this is one of its relatives, the artist's bracket, Ganoderma aplanatum. There are quite a few Ganoderma species in the UK. Ganoderma lucidum is the name given to the British reishi, and then you have Ganoderma resonatum and a few others too. So the artist bracket is a very hard and woody fungus, so obviously you can't eat it, but it's got all these amazing properties within. And it has a very orangey brown spore print, so when it's sporing, you'll see these covering all over the area where it's growing. The artist bracket doesn't have any dangerous lookalikes. The only things you're going to confuse it with are just the other different Ganoderma species and potentially the hoof fungus, which does look similar, but it has a white spore print, not a brown one. All of the Ganoderma mushrooms share similar medicinal properties and the artist bracket, for example, and the reishi have been used a lot in traditional Chinese medicine for hundreds of years and they have properties such as anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, antioxidant, and immunomodulating, which means they can activate or suppress the immune system as needed. By the way, I'm not a medical professional, so don't take everything I say for medical advice. This is just my hobby. I've been foraging for about five years and I'm very interested in herbal medicine as well. So yeah, please do your own research if you want to be doing the same thing. This is just me sharing my knowledge and providing it as a guide.
In terms of basic nutrition, mushrooms are actually a rich source of vitamins and minerals. So just by eating more mushrooms, you are benefiting your health. Obviously the hard bracket fungi in this video aren't edible. If you did try and eat some artist bracket, you'd probably break your frickin' teeth. A tip for veggies or vegans out there, you can actually get a lot of your B-complex vitamins from eating more mushrooms. And something else cool is that most edible mushrooms contain all of the nine essential amino acids, making them a complete protein. There are more health benefits of consuming mushrooms, but let's just get to the point and discuss the parts that are considered medicinal. I will try and keep it simple. So, the fibre inside the cell walls of fungi is partly made up of glucans. Glucans are a type of polysaccharide, and a polysaccharide is a complex carbohydrate. There are two major types of glucans, the alpha-glucans and the beta-glucans. So you might have seen on mushroom supplements a label with the beta-glucan percentage written on it. Obviously, when making your own products DIY style, you can't measure these things necessarily, but at least you know what's going into it, and you can also make the extract stronger or weaker if you wish. There are also other active components found in fungi cell walls, but the beta-glucans have most of the studies behind them. They can work in our bodies to activate different types of immune cells, and this results in the prevention and treatment of all different kinds of infections, such as viral, bacterial, parasitic, and even ones from pathogenic fungi. And this also includes activating the cells that fight against cancer. Mushrooms such as the turkey tail, reishi, and shiitake and chaga have some of the highest amounts of beta-glucans that you can get. Unfortunately, only a small percentage of beta-glucans are soluble during digestion, so this is why we use heat to break down the bonds in the fungal cell walls in order to make the glucans more soluble and bioavailable in the body. There is lots of debate and lots of opinions on the ideal temperatures and the ideal timing for making water decoctions, which is the tea. Some people say a very low heat for up to 12 hours is ideal, and then some say simmer for a couple of hours at a higher heat. So after reading many, many methods, I like to settle somewhere in the middle. So what I do is break the chosen mushroom into very small bits and then simmer gently for a minimum of just four hours. Obviously, the longer you leave it, the better. And I also wait to see until the water has reduced by about half. Don't worry though, because I'm going to post another video soon, which will be more of a tutorial on these preparation methods mentioned in this video. So keep an eye out for that, because I'll just take you through some of the steps properly on that video. As well as beta-glucans, we have access to terpenes and phenolic compounds. Diterpenes and triterpenes are the active compounds found in lion's mane, for example, and reishi, and other various types of fungi, and have been quite well studied. Regarding lion's mane, diterpenes are the compounds associated with the nerve regenerating effects, and that's why it's known as a good functional mushroom for the brain. And funnily enough, it kind of resembles a brain, don't you think? <laughs> reishi and its other relatives in the Ganoderma family are known to contain many different triterpenes, some of which are ganoderic acid, ganoderols, and lucideric acid. The research into these compounds shows promising potential with activities such as anti-cancer, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and blood sugar regulating, just to name a few. Okay, okay, nearly there. One last thing. What are phenolic compounds? This group refers to things like flavonoids, phenolic acids, and polyphenols, and they are considered as protective due to their antioxidant activity. By increasing antioxidant activity in our bodies, we can reduce the oxidative stress that is contributing towards the degenerative processes that are related to things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, inflammatory diseases, and aging. All right, so how do we access all of this good stuff? Some terpenes are water soluble to a degree, and for some, they are more soluble in alcohol. So this is why people make a double extracted tincture. So this is part water and part alcohol. So basically, if you want to get as much as you possibly can out of a mushroom, then a combined extract of water and alcohol is probably the best way to go. So that's that. Obviously, this was just a brief overview and simple explanation. If you're interested in the science, then there's plenty of information and studies out there. So go wild. Oh, you can also go a step further and make your own powdered extract 
by making the water and alcohol extracts and then dehydrating them. But obviously this is extra work and extra fuss. But this is not a complete list of all the wild mushrooms that have medicinal value, but the ones I have named are very common and easy to find. Of course, lion's mane is one of my favorites, but it's quite rare and is on a protected species list in the UK. So I would not be harvesting it if I found one. The other two herisium species that grow in the UK, on the other hand, are not on the protected list for some reason. One last thing to note is that if you do go foraging somewhere, it's best to check the local laws and make sure you're not on a protected site or a site of special scientific interest. I'd also suggest just not being obvious about it. So don't go skipping around the forest, swinging a big basket of mushrooms because you'll more than likely have people challenge you about it. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you found this video useful, then subscribe and stay tuned for the mushroom preparation video that I'm going to bring out next.